Okay, you guys, so we are off and running with your video class, and we left off um, speaking about uh, Captain John Smith. So we just finished discussing really his unique and providential role in the establishment and the survival, quite frankly, of the first permanent English settlement, which was founded at Jamestown in 1607. If I had you there in person, I'd be asking you, and during whose reign was it founded? Um, and hopefully you would tell me King James I, Jamestown. Um, so just again to place us in time, 1607, um, 1609 to 10 is actually, you know, 1608 to 09, I think, is when John Smith is president of the council, and then he will leave. Um, during this entire period, uh, Pocahontas is going to have interactions with the colonists. Um, you, see, you see that I have given her this title, the instrument of God to preserve and bless the colonists, and we're going to see some examples of that. She repeatedly steps in. Um, uh, really to save them time and time again. But then also she is the recipient of preservation and blessing because it's through these colonists that she receives the gospel of Jesus Christ. Her given Indian name was Matoaka, but her father called her Pocahontas, which meant little mischief. So um, at 12 or 13 years of age, you can kind of get a picture for what her personality might have been like and, um, and why um, her father had her, chosen her as a particular favorite. She meets Captain John Smith for the first time after he was captured. We talked about all of that last week um, and brought to her father. Her father's name was Wahoon Seneca. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly um, and you don't, you're not responsible for that. But I want you to know basically that his name was not Powhatan. He was chief over the Confederacy of Indian Tribes that was called the Powhatan Confederacy. Um, we discussed last week what happened, you know, he was taken from camp to camp, um, tribe to tribe for a six weeks, um, a six week period of time, after which he was brought back into the presence of the chief and there was some sort of ritual, some sort of ceremony that took place um, during which he was convinced, you know, they brought out these stones and these men appeared with clubs and um, Pocahontas intervened on his behalf and saved his life. So. Um, Smith actually then, I put here, lived with the tribe for a short time. It was a very short time, like maybe only a week more, before he then returned to, um, to the Jamestown, the fledgling Jamestown colony. In the months that followed, Pocahontas, this young girl, came to the fort several times, and she brought supplies to them in the winter. Um, she even risked her own life several times to warn John Smith of impending native attacks. Much later, and we'll get to that in just a second, she's going to be invited to visit the court of King James. And it was King James I and his queen, Queen Anne. And Captain John Smith was concerned about how she was going to be received in court. Now, by this time, of course, he's already back in England. But he wrote a letter, knowing that she was coming, he wrote a letter to Queen Anne, really describing how she had been um, of assistance to them. And this is what he wrote. Jamestown, with her wild train, meaning a train of people, so Jamestown with her wild train, she as freely frequented as her father's habitation. And during the time of two or three years, she, next under God, was still the instrument to preserve this colony from death, famine, and utter confusion. Which, if in those times had once been dissolved, Virginia might have lain as it was at our first arrival to this day. If you don't understand kind of the, the construction of what he's just said, He's saying that next to God, she was the instrument for preserving this colony and keeping it from death, famine, and utter confusion. If she had not been there, he's saying, then we probably would not have survived and Virginia might still be in the same condition that it was prior to our arrival, meaning undeveloped. So he gives her great credit in the preservation of the colony. Now, during Smith's tenure as uh, president of the, of the Jamestown uh, Council, there's relative calm between the Powhatan Confederacy and the colonists, but after his departure, war would break out. Um, it was during this time that Pocahontas is kidnapped, actually, by a Captain Samuel Argall, who had arrived just a couple years after uh, John Smith left. I believe 1611 was when he arrived, and Pocahontas, he was responsible for the kidnapping of Pocahontas. Ironically, he will also be the captain who is later responsible for taking her to visit the king in England. She taken as a member of the royal family from, um, from Jamestown or from Virginia. However, during the time frame that she was living with the colonists after she'd been kidnapped, now y'all understand, she's a wily girl, and she wasn't, she wasn't 
held captive. She wasn't locked in anywhere. She easily could have left. So she really makes a decision to stay there with them. And we're not, she developed an affinity for the colonists. She was in, as John Smith said, she was as often in their camp as she was in her father's. So there was something that attracted her to the colonists and she made a conscious decision to stay there with them. Um, still bad move on the part of the colonists who were acting and, and communicating that they were holding her captive. Um, pretty soon after this, um, after this event, the deputy governor, you don't have to remember his name, well, I'll tell you, Sir Thomas Dale. But both Sir Thomas Dale and we have a new pastor who's come into town, and his name is Reverend Alexander Whitaker. The first pastor was Reverend Robert Hunt, and Robert Hunt held the first Protestant worship service on American soil. He held it under a, um, a sail that was spread between two trees. And there at Jamestown today, there's a monument to that first Protestant service. And Robert Hunt was a man of strong character. So here, you know, he was surrounded by all these gentlemen and these guys that really didn't necessarily um, exercise great self-government. But he, by all accounts, um, was a wonderful man of very strong character. But however, he's going to die very shortly after they arrived there. That was Robert Hunt. And then they go a period of time without having a pastor on site. I believe it's also in 1611 that Alexander Whitaker arrives um, with Captain Samuel Argall. So between the deputy governor, whose name is Samuel Dale, or sorry, uh, Thomas Dale, Thomas Dale, uh, Thomas Dale and um, Reverend Alexander Whitaker, along with another new arrival named John Rolfe, really are putting effort into catechizing Pocahontas, helping her understand the faith, what Christianity is. She's observing, you know, their rituals and that they're going to church every day, that they're praying. So they begin to help her to teach her English and to help her to understand what the faith is. Um, by the time 1614 rolls around, she is ready to be baptized. Um, she makes a voluntary um, confession of faith and she's baptized. And at that time, she's given a Christian name and her Christian name is Rebecca. Soon after that, she and John Rolfe will be married. So we have the first known Protestant baptism in the New World and the first known Protestant marriage in the New World, both revolving around Pocahontas. Now, before they can get married, John Rolfe writes a letter. Um, he writes a letter to the governor, and then this letter has to be forwarded back to the council in London for permission to marry her. Now, the first question I want to ask to you is, why would he have to write this? Why would he have to get permission to marry Pocahontas? And most people will think, if, you know, if they think for a second, will say, um, you know, well, she was a native person, so and she, you know, she wasn't, maybe she'd have to convert first. And that's true. She would need to convert to Christianity. But really what the issue was is that he was a commoner, and she was considered royalty. She was a princess in the eyes of the king, in the eyes of the folks back in London, and had been communicated to those that were coming. They were to treat him as any head of state. They were to treat Powhatan, or Wahoon Sunkana, as, as a head of state. And so she, therefore, was a princess. And he was asking basically to marry out of his class. And he was asking for permission to do that because that could really impact um, the diplomatic relations between these two sovereign states, okay? So here's what he writes. But for the good of this plantation, for the honor of our country, for the glory of God, for my own salvation, and for, and for the converting to the true knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, an unbelieving creature, namely Pocahontas, to whom my hearty and best thoughts are, and have a long time been so entangled and enthralled in so intricate a labyrinth that I was even a wearied to unwind myself thereout. Can y'all read between the lines there? Because basically what he's saying is, I can't even think straight. I, I am so overwhelmed with this lady that my mind is in an intricate labyrinth and I am, t I am worn out trying to unwind myself. He goes on, likewise adding here into her great appearance of love to me, her desire to be taught and instructed in the knowledge of God, her capableness of understanding, her aptness and willingness to receive any good impression, and also the spiritual, besides her own incitements stirring me up here unto. In, in other words, she also is encouraging me. So it's not just me chasing after her, but she likes me. He says, now what should I do? Shall I be of so untoward a disposition as to refuse to lead the blind into the right way? 
Shall I be so unnatural as not to give bread to the hungry? Or I can't, or uncharitable? Shall the base fear of displeasing the world overpower and withhold me from revealing unto man these spiritual works of the Lord, which in my meditations and prayers I have daily made known unto him? God forbid. He is obviously given permission to marry Pocahontas, and that happens in 1614. She and Rolf will have one son. Um, their son is named after the deputy governor who had helped to convert her to Christianity, Thomas Dale, but he's named Thomas Rolf. And many prominent Virginia families can trace their lineage back to Thomas Rolf, to back all the way to Pocahontas. John Rolfe, of course, pioneers the crop that's going to become the literal gold of Jamestown. And that crop that finally will make them profitable is tobacco. In 1616, she's invited with her toddler son and her husband to come to England, and she is received there by King James and Queen Anne, and she's received as a foreign dignitary. This is a state, an official state visit. Um, it's while she was in England for those few months that this portrait that you see, and you'll glue in place, um, was painted of her. It was actually, it was at first a, um, like an engraving, and the engraving, goodness, is a little rough around the edges, um, so thankfully the person that then followed on behind and painted the portrait kind of softened her lines a little bit, um, but this is the anglicized version. This is Rebecca, um, as she would have been called there visiting the court of King James. As the ship prepared to take them all home, they had not even gotten out of the Thames River. They left London and they were down um, near a city called Gravesend and she became very, very ill and so she had to be taken ashore and um, she worsened and eventually died. And so she's buried there in a church at Gravesend, England. Um, I also want to point out to you on this portrait, let me grab my glasses read it to you but on the portrait there was this little inscription was part of the original portrait and if you go to see the portrait in the Smithsonian um, portrait gallery in Washington DC that's there but most of the time if you buy a postcard they cut this part off so I want you to see or know what it says so it reads Matoica also Rebecca daughter to the mighty Prince Powhatan Emperor of something I can't read um, in Virginia converted and baptized in the Christian faith and wife to the worthy Mr. Thomas Rolfe. Now, what I most want you to see is this reference to the fact that she was converted and baptized in the Christian faith. And that's what's now missing. I mean, we just, we keep seeing pieces of our history disappearing. So again, most of the time when you see this image or you even look it up online, it won't have the inscription at the bottom. Um, the other thing you may have picked up on is that the, um, the person that wrote the inscription back in the, um, in the early 1600s said that she was wife to the worshipful Thomas Rolfe, and that was actually her son. So somebody got a little mixed up, but she was wife to John Rolfe, mother to Thomas Rolfe. This is the statue um, that is placed in her memory at Gravesend, England. So this is outside in a garden behind the church there in Gravesend, and it was placed, I believe it was placed in 1907 on the 300th anniversary of Jamestown could be wrong on that you guys but I think that's when it was placed and an exact replica both of them were placed at the same time which is why I'm thinking it was 1907 the um, the replica statue is in Jamestown so there's one there in one statue there in the on the very spot that she would have roamed um, the very uh, the very streets that she would have turned cartwheels as um, John Smith described and then a duplicate of that statue is right near her burial place in England um, Pocahontas is also the only woman that is honored three times in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. She may be the only person outside of George Washington that's honored three times in the Capitol Rotunda. So I want to point that out to you. And actually, this picture doesn't show it very well. But there's a painting over here on the right-hand side. Um, my little cursor is not showing up very well. Let me see if I can do it with my finger. Yeah, right here. So this painting right here is the baptism of Pocahontas right there. And we're going to look more closely at it in just a moment. And then if you look up here at the top, um, this is called the frieze. So we'll look up here in the frieze in just a moment. Also up in the wall is this niche that we talked about before, the bas-relief sculpture of Pocahontas intervening on behalf of Captain John Smith. You also see, it's, it's just kind of fun seeing this, but <laughs> somebody got the date wrong back when they put this in in the early 1800s. Then they thought it was 1606, and we know, of course, it was December of 1607. 
um, placed in 1825, you guys, so very shortly after the Capitol Rotunda was complete. And there's another image of that bas-relief sculpture. And then up here, this is called the Frieze, and it has all of these wonderful images um, taken from American history. And Pocahontas is one of the scenes there. We see her again intervening on behalf of Captain John Smith and saving his life. Now let's talk briefly about this painting, The Baptism of Pocahontas by John Gadsby Chapman. So to do this, guys, you're going to have to flip through your note sheets a couple pages. Let me grab mine so I can tell you. Okay, so if you'll flip all the way to the last page, but you need the page that says The Baptism of Pocahontas. So not the very, not, not the back side of the last page, but the front side of the last page. And, um, this painting was commissioned in the oh gosh, 1840s, yeah, installed in the 1840 in the U.S. Capitol. And the painter was given his choice of several topics that he could paint on. So I've put that there on, their, on your page. It says, when the House of Representatives commissioned the artist, he was asked to choose any scene that would illustrate the discovery of America, the settlement of the United States, the history of the Revolution, or the adoption of the Constitution. And out of all of those topics, what he chose to paint um, was this baptism of Pocahontas. And he said he did that because he wanted to remind visitors to the Capitol of the, the purpose for which the Jamestown colonists came. And you all remember, you wrote about the purpose. They were coming to propagate the gospel to those that yet live in darkness and miserable ignorance of the true faith. And so he is showing that, at least in this instance, that they fulfilled that purpose um, that they had a sincere and fervent desire, he says, to spread the Christian faith, that's your blank, Christian faith, among the heathen savages. The other painting that we're going to look at in just a minute, which is called The Embarkation of the Pilgrims, it was completed about the same time. The two artists were working simultaneously on these images to go into the Capitol Rotunda, and they were filling up spaces. Um, the other four had already been filled by an artist named John Trumbull. You'll learn more about him later this year. But Trumbull had painted scenes from the American Revolution, and he had done those earlier. Um, so now in the 1840s, this was... Um, the choice of John Gatsby Chapman. It's just very interesting to me. We still see such faith-centered imagery um, that's being placed there in the Capitol Rotunda. When these paintings were unveiled, there was a little like brochure that was given to all of the guests that day. And in the, in the brochure, the artist described more about his painting. And that's what you have there on your page. He said, she stands foremost in the train of those wandering children of the forest who have at different times, few indeed and far between, been snatched from the fangs of barbarous idolatry to become lambs in the fold of the divine shepherd. She therefore appeals to our religious as well as our patriotic sympathies and is equally associated with the rise and progress of the Christian church as with the political destinies of the United States. I love, I love the fact that when you look around in the Capitol Rotunda, you're seeing prayer meetings, you're seeing baptisms, you're seeing um, faithful renditions of the Christian heritage of America all around you. Um, as we look at this painting specifically, I just want to point out a couple things to you. Certainly our eye is drawn, as it always is, to the, the lightest portion of the painting. And so, you know, we have this um, uh, feeling that light is kind of streaming from somewhere on high and it's illuminating this man, and this is Reverend Alexander Whitaker, and this woman, who is obviously uh, Rebecca. This would be John Rolfe standing behind her. And then this is her sister with a little baby, niece or nephew. This is her uncle. So this would be chief, the chief of the Powhatans, his brother. And he's a pretty well-known figure. Um, just a few years down the road, he's going to lead a, um, an attack, a long, actually a long, um, a long-standing war against the settlers. His name is Opikan Canoe. Opikan Canoe. And so you see he's he looks um uh sultry and kind of looking away and um he, he refuses to watch. But so does this man. This is her brother. His her brother is also rejecting Protestant Christian rejecting Christianity. So they're in attendance but we see um we see their their stance is um very revealing of 
how they're receiving this. Here we see a baptismal font. And what's kind of interesting about this is um, I, this probably was not the baptismal. We think they just had, um, that they probably did not have a big marble baptismal font at the time. Um, this would have happened in the 1608 church. Um, they had, the next church that we built was not until 1619. And so we think this was the uh, 1608 church, meaning that they probably would have had portable um, communion items and a portable baptismal holy water holder kind of a thing. Um, I shouldn't have said holy water, but but a portable baptismal system or whatever, not not this heavily carved and beautiful baptismal font. However, the reason you're seeing that one is because they do have one like that that's going to come fairly soon after, maybe in 1619 or 1630 or something, and it's imported to the colony. And that same baptismal font is now in the Bruton Parish Church in Williamsburg because when the when the capital moved to Williamsburg, um, they moved the the um, the main church to Williamsburg as well, and the baptismal font and all the silver, everything went with it. And so today, um, that baptismal font is considered one of the oldest religious artifacts in North America. And um, so while it was not the one, most likely, not the one that Pocahontas was baptized with, it would have come just a few years after her baptism and marriage. Let's see, what else to show you here? I think that's probably it in this painting. So, again, the baptism of Pocahontas. In 1619, we're going to see some changes come to Jamestown. There are three major events that take place that change the face of Jamestown and the face of English settlement in America. Number one, a new charter is granted by King James I, and it's negotiated by a man, I want you to know his name, Edwin Sands. Ed, I know it looks like Sandys, but it's Edwin Sands which gave the colony more ability to govern itself. Um, they were now allowed, rather than just having, um, already the London Council had been given really great authority over um, the governing of the colony. Well, now the London Council was passing that authority on, like letting, letting it cross the Atlantic and saying, you know what, we're going to allow you guys to govern yourselves. And so they would now govern themselves with a representative assembly, and they were to elect people from each of the areas, because by 1619 they're starting to spread out. They're not all inside that little triangular fort anymore. They, um, they have been given over time the ability to own titled portions of lands. Um, we talked about this a long time ago, but these little these portions of lands were called hundreds, and they were titled, in other words, private property that were given to a man. Um, I don't know what all of the conditions were for if purchasing the property, um, but what's really interesting to see here, guys, is we're going to write this down in just a second. In Spain, when the Spanish claimed land, it all belonged to the government. It belonged to the king. There was very little private land ownership in the New World. What you're seeing here is a whole different vision. The point being, these were Puritans. These were folks that thought that the property belonged in the hands of the people. They were the ones that were supposed to take dominion. Genesis had commanded the man and his wife to till the land and to take dominion and to be, um, to be productive. And the civil government just was supposed to protect the people and administer justice. It didn't have a role in owning all the land and doling it out to people. So as more and more of these folks had come and been granted hundreds, which meant that it was a land that was supposed to um, support a hundred families, so whatever that was in acreage, but they were granted these large portions of land called hundreds, and they were farming them, they were becoming productive, they're growing tobacco. But so each of these hundreds would then elect someone, and it was called they were called a burgess. And for those of you that had world history last year, that does come from a burg, right? So the, each hundred would elect its own one, its own one representative, who is called a burgess. And those burgesses met in something that was called the House of Burgesses. The Virginia Assembly still calls itself today. They have a House of Burgesses. So where in Florida we have a House of Representatives. In Virginia, they still retain that old colonial terminology, and they call themselves themselves the House of Burgesses. Okay, so these Burgesses, again, just so you get the point, they are representatives elected from each of these hundred family supporting units. This is the first example of truly representative government in the New World, and that's 1619. Guys, their first meeting, the first time the Burgesses meet, 
they meet in the choir of the church, the new church that had been built there, um, the pictures of which I showed you. And they opened in prayer, and gosh, I wish I had that piece of paper with me. I don't have that piece of paper with me right now. Um, but I'll grab it in just a second and read to you the prayer that was um, given at this first, this opening ceremony of the first ever meeting of a representative assembly in North America. Okay, next thing that happens, the Jamestown ladies or the Jamestown brides arrived. By 1619, it's becoming very obvious that just having all these men over there is not the best option. And again, this, the Puritan mindset says we are coming to establish dominion and we want families to grow up and we want people to stay there, not just go make their fortune and come home. And they realized the best way to do that are by sending ladies. Um, these ladies had been told, they actually had they'd been advertised for in the London papers, and they had been told that there were eligible and honorable bachelors working in Jamestown. And these ladies had volunteered to come to the colony knowing it was going to be very difficult, but their intention was to come and marry. I'm going to grab something real quick and read to you. The men, the, uh, the men in Jamestown had to pay <laughs> for the passage of, the, of these ladies. If you intended to court any of them, you paid for the passage of one of the ladies. And let's see here. The London Company's new policy was to anchor the ambitions of the male adventurers to the soil by importing English ladies. In November of 1619, Sandys, Sands rather, requested to send over a hundred young maids to become wives, so that wives, children, and family might make them less movable and settle them together with their posterity in that soil. And... Um, we have another company report, London Company report, that says, So that the planters' minds may be faster tied to Virginia by the bonds of wives and children, care has been taken to provide them young, handsome, and honestly educated maids, whereof 60 are already sent to Virginia. You have to know that that must have been very good news to the gentlemen um, that were waiting there in Virginia, that there were 60 honest uh, handsome, honestly educated, and handsome maids on their way. Uh, but this was truly, guys, the most biblical way of fulfilling the dominion mandate. It began with God's first unit of government, which was the family, and that's what they were going to establish. So we really, we don't have record of what happened uh, when the ladies arrived, but you can just imagine all these men who just wait, looking downstream, waiting for the sails to come around the bend, um, and, and then all these wonderful women coming down the gangplank, and we don't have any record again of how everybody kind of matched up and found their perfect partner, but everybody got married and established some of the first families of Virginia. Um, also in 1619, the first black Africans will arrive, but you need to understand that the first black Africans to come, um, they, were, they, had in, they were intended to be slaves, and they came as cargo on like a Dutch ship or something. However, they were not sold as slaves. They were um, indentured, so these were not slaves. They were rather indentured servants, and so the Virginians took them on as indentured servants who worked off their indenture, worked off you know, just like um, the same amount that it would have cost to bring one of the ladies across. These uh, black Africans then worked off their passage, so that the passage was paid for by a, by a Virginian, and then more than likely they did go out and help them on their farms, but they worked off their indenture and became freemen. And then they were um, entitled to own property. And so what's really interesting is, it's actually an interesting study just to get online and start looking about some of the old... Um, free black families in Virginia and they're very proud many of them are very proud of their roots and the fact that they were never slaves um, so there was a significant free black population in Virginia from the very beginning that continued to grow and grow so of course we think of Virginia and that all black people in Virginia were slaves during the time just before the Civil War but that's really not true and the free black population traces its roots back to these um, indentured servants who arrived. Um, I want you to make a note there at the bottom. I think I put something in your note sheets about the, um, the 1609 charter and subsequent charters. Let me flip back to it myself here. Yeah, the 1609 charter renewal. So what I, and whatever words you want to write it down, or you can pause the slide for a minute and write that down if you'd like. But essentially, um, I just want you to understand that 
starting with the 1609 charter and some of the ones following, because of the Puritans that were sitting on the council, they really were, they were pursuing, the, the, rather the Puritans that were investors in the London Company. They were encouraging titled land, meaning private property ownership. They wanted more, they, they recognized that this communal living thing was not producing prosperity. And it was just part of their Puritan thinking that we need to have ha property in the hands of the people, which I've discussed enough already, that, that the, the charge was given to individuals to take dominion and to be productive. Um, so they made moves within their charters to provide for that, for more and more titled land to go to individuals. So essentially, this is providing government endorsement of private property rights. It, there was now protection of private property. It was right there in the charter. So the local council, the House of Burgesses, they were required to live up to the charter. That's, that's what they were called to do. So the government is now protecting the private property rights of these individual Virginians. And as we see, what's going to happen is Virginia is going to become a very prosperous colony very quickly. All right, I'm going to pause right there, and then we will get into the last part of our note sheets, which is um, about the English separatists, the pilgrims.